Welcome to all of you joining us this afternoon for Parliament for Knowledge Mobilisers. Really pleased that you could join us. My name's Naomi. I am part of the Knowledge Exchange Unit at the UK Parliament. The role of the Knowledge Exchange Unit is to support and to strengthen the exchange of information and expertise between Parliament and the research community. We do that in lots of different ways. We provide training for researchers about working with Parliament, as you know. We've got plenty of online resources, some of which I'll direct you to later. We promote opportunities that we find for researchers to work with Parliament. We run academic fellowships. And really importantly, we are just a point of contact for anyone from the research community who would like to work with Parliament and find out more about how to engage with Parliament through their research. OK, so let's get started. This is what I'm planning for us to cover this afternoon. We are going to talk about what is the UK Parliament, Parliament and government and a bit about the devolved administrations. And then we are going to get stuck into who uses research at the UK Parliament and ways for you to support your institution and your colleagues engagement with Parliament. I'm going to give you some ideas for incentives for researchers to work with Parliament. That could be part of your job to persuade researchers that this is something they can do. Uh, and I'm going to let you know what support you can have and how you can work with us, Parliament's Knowledge Exchange Unit. Hope that sounds like what you've signed up for. So let's get started straight away then. What is the UK Parliament? UK Parliament has three parts. We've got the House of Commons, which is where our MPs work. The House of Lords, full of uh, members of the House of Lords or peers, mainly appointed and from many different walks of life, um, uh, people working in the House of Lords. And the monarch is also an official part of Parliament. So the monarch's role is mainly ceremonial. She opens Parliament each year and she signs off each piece of legislation passed by Parliament. But as I say, it is a ceremonial role. We're going to leave her respectfully aside for the rest of the afternoon and we're going to focus on the House of Commons and the House of Lords. What does Parliament do? Just a quick overview of that represents the people. It's where our MPs go to represent the constituencies for which they've been elected. Checks and challenges the work of government, so scrutiny processes and quite a bit of what we talk about this afternoon will be about those scrutiny processes. Makes and changes laws, so legislation. We're not going to talk too much about legislation this afternoon, but if you would like to know more about the legislative process and, and how to feed in, then you're really welcome to get in touch with us afterwards for more information. We can direct you to where that is. Debates the most important issues of the day, so it's where MPs and members of the House of Lords can bring issues for a debate and to get a response from the government. And checks and approves government spending, so the government needs to get tax and budget proposals approved by Parliament before those can be enacted. So it's a good moment to pause and look at what is government. Here is a carefully worded sentence about the government. It's the party or the parties who can command the confidence of the House of Commons. That's who forms the government. They can, it's all about that word confidence. So the government need to be able to demonstrate that they have the confidence of the majority of our elected representatives. And that confidence of our elected representatives is what gives them the mandate or the right to be in power. It's usually demonstrated by a government winning votes in the House of Commons. Um, not always, of course. What does the government do? The government runs public departments, runs government departments, so Home Office, Department for Education, Department for Health and Social Care, etc. Proposes new laws to Parliament, so most new laws do come from the government and they are accountable to Parliament. So here is just another way of looking at the fact that Parliament and government are not the same thing. So as we know, Parliament is in Westminster. It is all members of the House of Lords, all MPs and the monarch. And government is down the road in Whitehall. It is some MPs, some members of the House of Lords who've been chosen by the Prime Minister to be ministers, to run government departments, decide on the policy and spending of those government departments um, and introduce new laws and they are accountable back to Parliament. So they need to come to Parliament to explain and justify their decisions and spending. 
Now, you might think I'm over egging this point slightly about the difference between Parliament and government, but it's really important for you as knowledge mobilisers to understand because there are opportunities for researchers to engage with um, all of these institutions, but they might just do so for different reasons. So if a researcher you're working with is looking to be involved in some policy development, perhaps they are sitting on a working group for a government department, um, perhaps they are looking at the idea for a new law which is being worked up, that is all working with government. If that researcher you're working with is looking to challenge something that the government is doing to really scrutinise the way a policy is being implemented or whether a policy is working, uh, perhaps a researcher is interested in a piece of legislation that's currently on its journey towards becoming a law. That is all working with Parliament. So it's just useful to really understand the distinction between these parts because researchers might be doing it for different reasons and they might need different support. Of course, in the UK, we do have a devolved context. In Northern Ireland, we have the Northern Ireland Executive and the Northern Ireland Assembly. In Scotland, we have the Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament. And in Wales, we have the Welsh Government and Senedd Cymru or the Welsh Parliament. So if you live or work in one of those devolved areas, there is an extra layer of representation and decision making between any more local government and the UK Parliament. Um, so some issues are devolved to those devolved administrations and they tend to be things which can be regulated on on a more local level. So things like education, health, justice, agriculture, language, etc. And then some powers are reserved to Westminster and these tend to be things which can be uh, which affect the country as a whole, such as defence or foreign policy. So appearing on your screens now is a bit of um, a table showing lots of different teams at Parliament that use research. We've got House of Commons select committees and House of Lords select committees, and then there are a few joint select committees as well. Um, they're part of the legislative process, particularly public bill committees in the House of Commons use research. The House of Commons Library and House of Lords Library and POST, the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. So you'll obviously notice that some of these teams are in green and some are in red, depending on whether they work in the House of Commons or the House of Lords. And then there are some purple teams who are bicameral, which means that they support both houses of Parliament. So these are the kind of formal uh, parts of Parliament that use research. This floating box down the bottom is the more informal or political side of who uses research at Parliament. So we've got individual MPs and their researchers, confusingly job titled researchers. These are members, uh, members of staff who work for MPs to support them carrying out their parliamentary duties. Individual peers and their researchers, again, members of staff who work for those peers and all party parliamentary groups or APPGs. What I'm going to do uh, for the next quarter of an hour or so is take you on a whistle stop tour through these parts of Parliament, just a little bit about them, how they use research and some tips for how you can support researchers at your institution to feed their research into Parliament using these processes. We'll start with select committees. You may have seen these on TV, you may have even watched or attended some of them. The point of select committees, the aim of them is to conduct inquiries and to produce reports on anything to do with the government's work. Um, so they are made up of MPs and members of the House of Lords and uh, they conduct these inquiries which scrutinise a particular issue. In the House of Commons, there is a select committee for every government department. So there's an education select committee, a work and pension select committee, a foreign affairs select committee, etc. And then there are some more cross cutting committees as well, such as the environmental audit committee who look at the government's environmental impact across departments. And then in the House of Lords, the committees are all more cross cutting. So, for example, there is a science and technology committee in the House of Lords, um, European uh, or European Union committee as well, uh, economic affairs committee, etc. 
So the way that these committees work is that they will decide on a subject for an inquiry, something to do with the work of government, and they will put out a call for evidence. It's worth pausing on the word evidence here. It doesn't mean what you might mean evidence to mean in a research project or a research context. It doesn't mean evidence as we would use it in a court of law. The word evidence for a select committee means anything submitted to that committee in response to an inquiry. So there will be a call for evidence with some questions in it and evidence is what comes back in in answer to those questions. It could be a paper written by an academic or a group of academics that's counted as evidence. It could be a report from a charity working in a particular area. It could be an email from an individual about their lived experience of a particular issue. It could be a submission from a business. Uh, it could be a paper from a lobbying company. Any of these things can be submitted as evidence. Based on all this evidence, the committee will produce a report which makes recommendations to government. How can government change or improve what they are doing in this particular area? Um, just as an extra uh, opportunity for researchers to work with committees, as well as this idea of evidence, quite often committees will employ a subject specialist as a specialist advisor. Uh, so this is someone who works with the committee either on uh, a specific inquiry, so in a particular topic or on a longer term basis as a specialist in a particular field. And their role is to help shape the scope of an inquiry, make sure the questions asked are the right ones, make sure that the committee is talking to the right people and reaching all the people that they need to talk to to get evidence on a particular topic. I'll just um, say one more thing about select committees then, which is to give you some tips on how your institution and researchers that you work with could engage with Parliament. So here are your top tips. The first one is to try and think about which policy area or um, areas your institution or your faculty's research and expertise is most likely to fit into. So rather than starting from what a research project is looking at, you might need to flip it round a bit and think about actually which policy area does this feed into and then look at the committee which is working on that. So is it health or mental health? Is it justice perhaps? Uh, is it foreign affairs? Perhaps you need to look at the Treasury Committee. Um, so it's more about thinking rather than just starting from uh, the research going on at your institution, it's about thinking about which policy area you think that could feed into and then look at the committees looking at that policy area. So once you've kind of identified some different policy areas that you could perhaps feed into, it's really worth uh, forwarding or flagging up relevant select committee inquiries to colleagues. How are you going to find them? Uh, I'd really suggest that you follow any relevant select committees on Twitter if there are specific policy areas that you work in or that you work to support. Uh, you can follow them on Twitter. If you're not on Twitter, you can sign up for email alerts from those committees uh, via the Parliament website. Um, you can also, of course, encourage colleagues who work in particular areas to sign up for email alerts or follow on Twitter any committees for which their research could feed into, uh, not only for inquiries that they could respond to, but also for any special advisor roles that might come up that they could apply for and work as. And finally, you might uh, therefore end up finding colleagues want to contribute evidence to a particular inquiry or perhaps you want to yourself. Um, there's some guidance on how to write good written evidence on the Parliament website. So moving on from select committees, there are some other areas of Parliament that um, I wanted to talk to you about in terms of how research can feed in. And uh, mainly I want to focus now on the research and information teams at Parliament. The first of these that I wanted to talk to you about is the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology or POST. Uh, there are four teams within POST. Uh, these are Biological Sciences and Health, Physical Science and Technology, Energy and Environment and Social Science. They all work in quite an interdisciplinary way and it's not all just kind of pure science and technology. So keep an open mind if that's not your area. If you're a arts and humanities researcher, you may still find POST a useful place to work with. POST is probably the closest bridge between research and policy. 
the aim of POST is, is to try and ensure that the best available research evidence is feeding into parliamentary business. One of the main things which POST does is to produce horizon scanning briefings called POST notes. And these are four page uh, documents which um, take about three months to produce. They are based on a literature review, interviews with 20 to 30 stakeholders, and they are peer reviewed uh, before they are published. The topics on which these post notes are written are the next big technical topics that are likely to be coming across the parliamentary agenda in the next year or so. So they're really looking ahead at what MPs and Lords are going to need a research briefing on in, uh, in the future, in the near future. Post also hold events which bring together stakeholders, MPs and Lords and experts in particular areas. For example, uh, this term, there's been a series of post events on migration. Uh, post also run fellowships. So there is a whole series of PhD fellowships which are available um, via post for PhD students to come and work at Parliament for three months. The other side of research and information at Parliament is the House of Commons and House of Lords libraries. So these are briefing services for MPs and members of the House of Lords, as well as being physical libraries where those members can borrow books. The House of Commons library has um, about 80 subject specialists who produce briefings on particular um, policy areas for which they are responsible. And the House of Lords Library is staffed by generalists who will pull together briefings on a real range of different policy areas. An MP or a Lord can get in touch with the Commons or Lords Library and ask a question and ask for a briefing about a particular topic. So, for example, uh, an MP could ring the House of Commons Library and say, can I have the unemployment figures for my constituency? I'm about to go into a debate on fracking. What's the latest uh, research around that? Um, I'm looking at legislation on animal cruelty. Can you tell me the current regulations in the UK? That this kind of, kind of things I'm making up, but to give you examples of the kind of range of questions that could be um, answered by the Commons and Lords Libraries. And they will also produce briefings on business that is happening at Parliament right now, so in the next week or two. So the Commons and Lords is, is really much more of a kind of reactive and responsive service to what MPs and members of the House of Lords need right now, uh, current affairs basically, and Post is kind of looking ahead to produce um, impartial uh, research briefings on, uh, on future topics. So in terms of being able to engage with research and information teams from your institution, uh, here are our top tips on that. The first one is to sign up to the post mailing list. And if you're on Twitter, to follow post on Twitter. Also encourage your colleagues to sign up as well or to follow post. Post announces the next topics which they are going to be writing briefings on a month or so in ahead. So you can get a heads up on any briefings which are coming up, which you feel colleagues at your institution could contribute research on. So if you see any relevant post notes which are being written, any events which are being run by post that you feel researchers at your institution could attend or contribute to, any fellowship opportunities which are happening at post for PhD students at your institution, then you can promote them and forward them on to relevant colleagues. And another way that you might want to think about working with these research and information teams is actually to proactively introduce yourself or your research centre or your institution. So, uh, as I said, there are four sections of post, so you might want to introduce yourself or some colleagues to the relevant section of post. The email address is post at parliament.uk and you might also want to introduce uh, your institution to the Commons Library um, to offer contributions to any Commons Library briefings that are being written. And the address for that is papers at parliament.uk. Just a kind of short introduction about yourself and what expertise you can offer could be really useful for the Commons Library. Now you'll remember from that slide about who uses research at Parliament that there was that kind of more informal side of research use, the more political side. And I mentioned all party parliamentary groups or APPGs. Uh, so these are informal groups of MPs and members of the House of Lords. There's one for nearly every country in the world and there is a huge range of subject groups from asthma to veterans. Uh, they all work in a different way. 
because they are run by members for the members. If you'd like an analogy, um, I think they're a little bit like uh, student societies at a university. So they are all different. Some of them meet very regularly. They hold a lot of events. They run inquiries. They do loads of uh, campaigning work and some of them meet on a less regular basis. The point of them is for MPs and Lords to develop their knowledge on a particular topic, to meet other MPs and Lords interested in that topic and to show that they are interested in something. I think there are two ways that you as knowledge mobilisers can use these groups. The first is to have a look at the A to Z list of groups. So take a look at that list of groups. See if you can identify any that are of relevance to researchers at your institution or your faculty or particular research projects on which you're working and get in touch with those groups. Ask if there's any activity going on. Are they holding any meetings that you could call into? Uh, could you brief them on your research? How can you contribute to their work? The other way I'd suggest you could use all party parliamentary groups is to look at who is a member of them. So you can get a membership list from that group and that gives you a targeted list of MPs and Lords who are potentially interested in the topic on which you are researching. And then you can get in touch with those individual members to offer to brief them or to send them your findings. I want to leave you with some kind of first steps for how you support your institution's engagement with Parliament. And one and two, I think, are, are linked. So the first is to decide why do you want to do this? What would you like to achieve? Is it that you would like researchers at your institution to be recognised at Parliament? Is it because you want the findings of those researchers to be used in the scrutiny of government? Um, is it because researchers have approached you and asked you to help them influence policy? So why are you doing it? What do you want to achieve? And then have a think about which areas of policy your institution's knowledge or research or expertise could relate to. So you'll remember I mentioned this when we were talking about select committees. Once you've done that, that's the hard bit really of working out why you want to do something and where you're going to target. And then position yourself to spot those opportunities to be involved when they come up. So follow particular select committees, either on Twitter or by signing up for email alerts. And when you see relevant calls for evidence for the researchers which you support, forward them on, send them on and flag them to researchers. Sign up to the post mailing list and look out for any relevant post notes. Remember those big four page briefings for members. Look out for any relevant post notes which are being written that you think your researchers could contribute to and then forward them on. And get in touch with any relevant all party parliamentary groups, those informal groups of MPs and Lords. Find out a bit more about their activities and how you and your researchers at your institution could contribute. So we've thrown quite a lot of information at you. Let's go over to Sarah. I'm sure she's got loads of questions to, uh, to answer. Hi, Naomi. So the first question is, are there platforms similar to yours, so similar to the Knowledge Exchange Unit, which focus on knowledge exchange with government departments, which is um, a really good question. So the short answer is no, there's nothing exactly the same, nothing um, directly comparable in government. But I would like to give you just three tips to help you um, kind of enhance your knowledge exchange with, with government departments. So three pointers, um, three different mechanisms. Firstly, government is engaging a lot with researchers through UPenn, which is the Universities Policy Engagement Network. That's a network of different universities around the UK. Um, it's practitioners, it's knowledge mobilisers like yourselves who are there to kind of generate and enable impact. And we're seeing that government departments are putting calls out through UPenn. So if your institution is not a member of UPenn, make sure they sign up and you can find them online very easily. Second pointer is that we do have um, some counterparts, not exactly the same as us, but there are uh, research, sorry, there are um, civil servants working in government doing um, work with academics. So would certainly point you towards the Open Innovation Team, which is a team that works with researchers, brings in academics to support on delivery of projects across different government departments. So uh, give them a Google, have a look at, at, at what they're doing and get involved with their work. 
And the third pointer I would give you is to uh, have a look at government departments, areas of research interest. That's another way that you and your researchers can engage with government. So all the government departments publish these areas of research interest. It's essentially different areas where they'd like more information, uh, more evidence, more insights. And so have a look at those and see if there are any needs that you feel uh, your researchers uh, can fill. Another question related to government, uh, really the contrast between government and parliament, is someone said, are we saying that engaging with government is a quicker way for researchers to make an actual impact? I think, uh, no, we're definitely not. I think the two are so different, the institutions are so different that uh, your engagement and impact will will not really be comparable. Um, kind of to put, paint you a very simple picture, the Department for Education is supported by you know, hundreds and hundreds of civil servants, whereas the Education Select Committee, which is scrutinising the Department for Education, is supported by perhaps six or seven uh, members of parliamentary staff. So they're very different organisations. If you engage with the Department for Education, there are hundreds of people to navigate. If you engage with the Education Select Committee, there are six or seven members of staff um, and a committee of, you know, um, between 10 and 20, depending on the committee. So very different bodies to engage with and doing very different things. So whilst government is making policy, directly making policy, parliament is scrutinising that policy. So your engagement will be different and your impact will be different. Recall, though, that the role of uh, Parliament is to to challenge the work of government. So, you know, if you're seeing that the government is doing something, you think their policy is not right. You've got an option to get in touch with with those in government and uh, share those insights with them, encourage them to change their policy. Or you've got that option to get in touch with uh, with Parliament and Parliament's job is to check and challenge and scrutinise that policy. So if they're doing that anyway, that might be more of an open door for you to push at because you'll be able to support them to do that. So really different uh, organisations doing different things. So I don't think it's really comparable. Um, and then we've had a few questions around committees as well. So just wanted to touch in on some of those. I think there'll be uh, interesting insights for, for people who are listening. First question is that when you submit evidence, does it show up in official reports if it's accepted or is it simply to create a broad overview for committee members? So essentially all evidence that is submitted is published. Again, evidence in this context is anything which is submitted to the, to the select committee. So it's all published on the web pages, which is great for you because it means you've got that paper trail you can point people towards to show that you're engaging with parliament. Um, everything is published with the exception, with the caveat that if there's something you don't want to be made public, perhaps for reasons of confidentiality or sensitivity, you can request that of the committee, you can request it's not, um, it's not published. On the other hand, not all evidence is likely to be cited in reports. You know, if there are 20, 30, 40 more people all saying, making the same point, um, it's unlikely that all of those people, their submissions will be cited in reports, which leads me unexpectedly and seam seamlessly onto the next question about committees, which was if researchers respond to calls for evidence, what can they do to give their submissions the best chance of being picked up and making an impact? So I've got one minute left, so I'm going to finish by giving you five pointers to help make your evidence uh, a really strong submission. The first thing is to submit your evidence early. So lots of people work towards deadlines um, and that's fine. But the thing is, um, if everyone leaves it till the last minute and 300 pieces of evidence come in on the last day, that's going to make it very difficult for the committee secretariat to engage with that evidence in, in any real detail. So submit your evidence early so they've got more time and attention to give to it and it's got more chance of influencing the process of the inquiry. Number two is to respond to the terms of reference So make sure you're answering the questions that they've asked. Again, you don't need to answer all of those questions, just the ones that are directly relevant to you. Point number three is make sure your evidence is concise and clear. 
So committees give an upper limit of 3000 words, but we know from our staff, our colleagues, that they would much rather read a two sider and then come back for more information. So try and make that really concise and clear, really well structured. So you've got an executive summary, use bullet points and subheadings, make it really quick for them to scan through. Uh, number four, don't just synthesize the evidence, don't just synthesize the research, but make recommendations. Bear in mind that when committees conduct inquiries and write reports to the government, they make recommendations to the government on what they think the government should do. They've got to get those recommendations from somewhere. So why, why leave them the hard work of figuring them out? Why not make those recommendations for them? And you can put those caveats in. You can talk about whether there are options. You can talk about um, any um, uncertainty around your recommendations, but do make suggestions, do suggest action. And then finally, think about making your evidence citable. So evidence is cited, not all evidence is cited, but think about how you can structure your evidence so it would be really easy for someone to lift out one of your quotes and put that directly into the report. And with that, Naomi, I will hand back over to you. So with our last few minutes then, I want to leave you with a little bit more information. I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but I wanted it to be there for you to refer back to when we send the slides to you on afterwards, because I know that many of you will be in a role which involves encouraging researchers to work with Parliament to send their research out into other sectors, perhaps to feed their research into policy. This is what we've heard from researchers about the benefits for them um, of working with Parliament. So the, the benefit of them being able to shape policy to develop their own career and there's lots within that around networking, around um, actually reflecting back on their own research, to have new experiences, to raise their profile, etc. And then of course those magic words of REF and KEF and the KE Concordat that we know many of you will be working on. Um, we have done some work around uh, impact at Parliament for REF um, and we are working with Research England on the KEF as well. But um, I know we've thrown lots of information at you today about how you can support researchers to work with Parliament. You are not alone, I think is the message that I want to, uh, to leave you with today. These are our friendly faces. And this appearing on your screens is a huge list of work that we do to support you. So we run training, we run academic fellowships, we have uh, plenty of online resources. If you're on Twitter, please follow us on at UKPAL underscore research because we put on there every single opportunity we can find for researchers to work with Parliament. If you would like to join our Knowledge Mobilizer network, so this is um, a huge range of people at universities and research institutions across the whole of the UK who work in a role which involves sharing research from their institution with other sectors. We have a network of people in these roles and we use that network to send out and promote opportunities and to consult with the sector about what you need um, and what would make uh, what we can do to support you to support your researchers to engage with Parliament. Uh, we do lots of exploration and, and uh, discussion with communities of researchers who are underrepresented at Parliament and how we can work to better support those underrepresented communities. And we, uh, as I mentioned, we work with Research England and UKRI on the REF and the KEF and various other projects um, as well that we feed into to try and make sure that feeding research into Parliament um, is as easy as possible and is also easy for researchers to demonstrate the impact of what they have done. So your final tips about working with us then. Use our online resources. Please do share our how to guides with researchers at your institution and use them yourself if you would like to. If you're on Twitter, please follow us at UKPAL underscore research. You will get any opportunity that we can find for researchers to work with Parliament on there. If you'd like to get in touch with us, we are on KEU at parliament.uk, knowledge exchange unit KEU at parliament.uk. And on the other end of that email address is myself. It's Sarah who you've met answering questions and it's our colleague Laura as well. And as I mentioned, we have a knowledge mobilizer informal network that we use to update you, to send out opportunities and to consult with you on how we can support you. So for now, thank you so much for joining us and for bearing with us while we threw a lot of information at you. And I hope that you've found the session useful.